Good morning, and welcome to Congressman Deutsch's Telephone Town Hall. My name is Jason, and I will be the moderator for this call. We will begin in just a moment. Right now, we are in the process of dialing out the thousands of constituents like you. Please stay on the line so that we can allow more people to join. We will begin momentarily. If you would like to begin to receive Congressman Deutsch's coronavirus email updates, hit star three to sign up. You may also visit Congressman Deutsch's website, deutsch.house.gov slash coronavirus. Be sure to follow Congressman Deutsch on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We will begin momentarily. If you are just joining us, welcome to Congressman Deutsch's Telephone Town Hall. My name is Jason. I'll be the moderator for this call. We are in the process of dialing out the thousands of constituents, so please stay on the line so that we can allow more people to join, and we will begin momentarily. Throughout the call, if you would like to receive, if you would like to ask the congressman a question, you may hit star three. Also, if you would like to begin receiving Congressman Deutsch's coronavirus email updates, also hit star three and you will speak to a screener. Thank you very much for joining this morning. The Congressman is also posting resources on his website. You can re visit at deutsch.house dot gov slash coronavirus. We will begin momentarily. If you are just joining us, welcome to Congressman Deutsch's Telephone Town Hall. My name is Jason and I will be the moderator for this call. We will begin in just a moment. Right now we are dialing out to thousands of constituents just like you. Please stay on the line so that we can allow more people to join. If you have questions during the call, you may press star three and a member of our team will answer your call. Again, that's star three. Please be sure to visit the Congressman's website as well as his social media pages for updates. We will begin momentarily. Good morning and welcome to Congressman Deutsch's Telephone Town Hall. We will begin momentarily. Again, please dial star three if you have any questions and you will be connected to a member of our team. We will try to get to as many questions as we can. If we do not get to your question, you may leave the Congressman a message on his website at deutsch.house.gov. Again, that is star three. If you are just joining us, welcome to Congressman Deutsch's Telephone Town Hall. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Congressman Ted Deutsch, representing Florida's 22nd District. Thanks very much, Jason. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Ted. I really appreciate your joining the uh, telephone town hall this morning. Uh, this is um, this is an enormously challenging time for our community and for the country. Uh, we wanted to provide an opportunity for people to get together, uh, hear from from some experts who can help answer some questions, uh, give me an opportunity to share the latest that uh, that I know and that we've been doing uh, in Washington and, and here in Florida, uh, and most importantly to. Hear from you and try to address the, the very real concerns 
that uh, that everyone has about our health, about uh, about our economy, about our community. Uh, the call. I, I've invited some guests, as I said, to join the call to answer some questions. Uh, we're privileged to have our Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Nikki Freed, on the call with us. Uh, we've got Dr. Nicole Iovine, the Chief Epidemiolo Epidemiology Officer at uh, UF Health Shands, uh, and Dr. William Jackwis, who is a, a leading emergency medicine doctor. Uh, we have limited time with some of our guests, so I want to make just a brief statement before they present, and then we'll um, we'll have them speak, and then we'll take questions. Uh, again, I want to thank you for joining. This is an unprecedented moment in our country. In a matter of weeks, we've seen the spread of, of the coronavirus across the world. We've seen it become a global pandemic. Countries are closing their borders, ordering quarantines on a massive scale. We're being told to stay inside for weeks. Um, workers have been laid off or have had their hours cut severely. Business owners have been forced to cut back or shut down their, their businesses, their stores their, um, indefinitely. And Americans are worried about, about loss of income, worried about paying their mortgage, car loans, their rent, and putting food on the table. Um, these are real fears, and I think it's legitimate, it's important for us to talk about them. There are real fears about contracting the virus. Uh, there are frustrations about the lack of, of testing and the lack of clarity um, from government. But I, I just want to, I wanted to do this call among other things to just remind us that we're all in this together. Uh, we, um, we are Americans and, and we'll respond to this crisis. We'll take care of one another. That means doing our part to stop the spread of the virus and listening to guidance the CDC and the scientists, and that's what we're, we're going to offer this morning, uh, the guidance that says stay home to the extent that you can, minimize group gatherings, use social distancing, maintain good hygiene. We can't repeat these often enough, uh, but it also means thinking about our neighbors, uh, our seniors, uh, our friends with compromised health, any vulnerable person for whom this virus could be devastating uh, we need to do our part not only to keep ourselves healthy, but to keep them healthy and, and, and frankly, in so many instances to, instances, to help keep them alive. Um, so we've got to do our part. So must our government. I want to remind everyone um, as we go on, if you want to sign up for our newsletter about the coronavirus, or if you want to ask a question on this call, hit star three. Um, we'll get into much more detail about what the government is doing after we hear from from our guests on the call. So, um, again, I'm, I'm immensely grateful that you've taken the time to join us. Uh, I want to start um, with our, our first guest, Commissioner Freed. Um, Commissioner Nikki Freed has been uh, a real leader in the state's response. Uh, she's got a lot more to do, and we're grateful that, uh, how, given how busy she is in responding to this, that she's taken the time to join us. So thank you, Commissioner Freed. Uh, let me let's turn it over to Thank, thank you, Congressman, and, and really thank you for, for your leadership as well and, and hosting this town hall to get this information out. Uh, like the Congressman said, my name is Nikki Freed. I'm your Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And we're all you know, having this obviously growing concern over coronavirus, but I want everybody to know that we're all in this together uh, and be assured that we are doing everything possible in, in the state uh, to make sure that you are safe during these challenging times. So just want to bring everybody up to speed a little bit about what steps that we in Department of Agriculture are taking to minimize the threat of COVID-19 for our consumers, for our businesses, and keeping Florida's children fed during some of these school closures. We regulate about 40,000 grocery stores, markets, convenience stores, gas stations um, across the entire state. And so we have sent some guidance to them over the last couple of weeks to make sure that they are using best practices to reduce also the spread of the virus. Um, some of the letters that we've told them uh, that we've sent out is to please provide sanitary wipes to clean the keypads and nozzle handles at gas stations, uh, as well as shopping carts and, and basket handles at grocery stores. We also sent out another letter uh, to our gas stations uh, saying that you run out of any of the hand sanitizers, so please try to provide gloves. Uh, these are just two places that millions of people across the state go to every single day. We're also reminding businesses that all employees must comply with state rules for hand washing before and after preparing food, handling of raw food, and touching garbage. 
this is typical normal standard procedures. We just need to remind them uh, to be even more cautious and careful during these times. But that also goes for our, the consumers and the individuals. Uh, make sure that you're disinfecting your common surfaces, you're cooking foods to your recommended temperatures, you're regularly washing your hands and sanitizing them. But one of our biggest responsibilities that we have in the state is that we oversee and help fund uh, $1.3 billion in school lunch program which serves over 2 million of our kids, uh, serving over 245 million free or reduced lunches every single year. And so it is our job to make sure that even during these school closures that we are ensuring that our kids have meals available. So we activated a week and a half ago um, our Summer Break Spot website, uh, our call center, and just this week our text line to help families find where they can receive any of these free meals uh, for children during the COVID-19 school closures. And that's for all kids 18 and under regardless if you are already part of the school um, free breakfast or reduced breakfast and lunches um, we want to make sure that every every child 18 and under uh, has access to these free meals so we're also saying that if you need to find these locations you can first do it by uh, texting us at uh, fl kids meals to uh, 211-211 so again that's uh, sending a text at 211-211 and in the body of the text, it's FL Kids Meals. Or you can also call for a live operator 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's just by dialing 211. Uh, or if you're by a computer or been on your, your cell phones, uh, you can go to our website, which is summerbreakspot.freshfromflorida.com. We also have over 1 million low-sodium emergency meals for seniors for community group distribution. Uh, and just everybody needs to be rest assured, I have been in constant communication, not only with Publix, uh, and their CEO, but also all of our ag producers across the state. And I can assure everyone that there is a food supply and that our food supply chain is steady. Um, so there's no need to go to the food store and, and hoard food. Um, all it's doing is making it harder for elderly and, and those that are compromised. So we're seeing all of the, the, the news all across the state, and I'm sure you all have gone to the grocery stores and seen um, some of the empty shelves. But no, that's just because uh, everybody wiped them out that day, but there will be food again. Uh, they've increased the amount of trucks that they have going out uh, from two deliveries to six to eight deliveries a day. Um, so they are really keeping up with the demand as much as possible, but also showing why uh, they're closing down earlier so they can just restock. Uh, and also announced this week that Publix is having a 7 to 8 a.m. hour for all seniors and those that are um, have compromised immune systems. So please take advantage of those times if you're in that a 65 plus bracket uh, to go use that the public's one hour store. It's really important. I've also been in touch with the FDA and, and all of our scientists at the Department of Agriculture to let everyone know food is safe, that there is no evidence um, that COVID is actually transmitted from foods. Uh, but always, you know, make sure you're washing your fruits and vegetables. It's always a good habit regardless of, of this outbreak. Um, and also for the seniors, please again, take advantage of, of these extra shopping hours that some of our stores are having. So from South Florida and beyond, we're in this together and every step along the way. So if you want additional up-to-date information on some of the other things that we're doing, some of our emergency orders on any of our licenses and fees and, reg and registrations um, that we just put out yesterday, please follow us um, either on Facebook or Twitter at SDAX, or you can go us online, which is sdacs.gov. Um, thank you again for your, your, your leadership, Congressman, and I will turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Freed, um, and we're grateful for all that you've been doing, not only in, in your capacity as, as Commissioner, uh, addressing all of these, these issues that, that matter so much and ensuring that there's access to food and making sure that people get the nutrition they need, uh, but also in, in working with, uh, with the others in Tallahassee. Um, in so many other ways as well. Uh, and that's actually a good jumping off point for what I, I wanted to talk about next. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about what we've been working on in Washington, but it's important for everyone to understand uh, that just as Commissioner Freed is busy working with the governor and uh, Democrats and Republicans in Tallahassee, uh, Congress has been working together to address these issues. Uh, I've been in contact um, with leadership in Congress, but also with leadership, uh, also with leadership uh, at, uh, in 
the Senate, and uh, we've been in communication with the White House as well. Um, we really are all in this together. So let me just take a moment to walk through some of the things that we've done. Two weeks ago, uh, we voted to approve $8.3 billion in funding to support coronavirus response. That included close to a billion dollars for state and local health agencies, uh, about a billion dollars for medical supplies and preparedness measures at community health centers. We'll talk more about that in a, a few minutes. Uh, also, more than $3 billion for research and development of vaccines. Uh, that money is being uh, pushed out um, uh, at, even as we speak. Uh, this week, the president signed a second bill, which will provide free testing for coronavirus, uh, paid emergency leave, enhanced unemployment benefits, a uh, billion dollars in food assistance and food security, and additional funding into Medicaid. Uh, and we can talk in greater detail about any of those as, as we go forward. Um, next is is um, what we're going to be doing, hopefully, in the week ahead. Uh, Congress clearly is not done. This week, uh, committee leaders worked uh, on a stimulus package to help mitigate the health and economic damage that this crisis is causing. There are going to be a lot of businesses, large and small, um, every business, large and small, uh, has been and is being hurt by the impact of this virus. In South Florida, major industries like the airlines and cruise lines and hospitality and entertainment industries have already been hard hit. We've seen that throughout the community. Uh, but small businesses especially are feeling the pinch. We've, they've seen sales drop. They've had to make really difficult decisions about their employees and it, it is, frankly, still early uh, in our response. So th these are the lifeblood workers and industries of South Florida's economy, and Congress isn't going to forget them. And, and as we move forward, I just wanted to, to uh, stake out a, a few things that I think need to be in uh, the bill that, that we have going forward that we're working on. Uh, one, I think it's critically important that, that we provide resources to every American um, every American struggling to pay bills, put food on the table, and make ends meet because of all these closures. Uh, and whether, uh, and we're still working, uh, there's still a negotiation on what that amount should be and how long those payments should continue. Um, I think at this point we need to advocate uh, for, uh, for the higher numbers that we've been reading about and that we shouldn't just do this for a 30-day period. It's going to take longer. People are going to feel the pain longer than that, and, and we should uh, acknowledge that in the legislation that we are trying to pass in the next week. Um, we need protections for people who can't afford to make mortgage payments, car payments, student loan payments. Um, no one should have to fear foreclosure when they've been forced from their jobs because they're doing what the government has uh, told them to do to help stay safe and prevent this spread. Um, so there's a, a lot more to cover. Let me Let me also briefly run through some national and statewide guidance that we should be following, and I want to offer some resources. So I want to encourage everyone, as, as Jason has already pointed out, I want to encourage people to visit our website for these resources, deutsch.house.gov slash coronavirus or usa.gov slash coronavirus. Uh, there is also really important guidance from the CDC. I would encourage people to to check out that guidance. They can do it from our website or from the CDC's. But the CDC is recommending that everyone stay home as much as possible, that there be no gatherings of more than 10 people, that, uh, that no one visit nursing homes or assisted living facilities, and that there be no discretionary travel. Um, I think it's important for everyone to remember that. I want to talk about testing because we've gotten a lot of calls to the office about that. Uh, it has taken far too long to make testing available. I think we all acknowledge that. Still, uh, our testing capacity and availability is is way behind, and I am concerned that we're not testing enough. Now, I, I've heard from the Florida Department of Emergency Management that the state is increasing its capacity. There are now some drive-through uh, testing sites in Broward and Palm Beach County, but CDC's testing requirements still make it harder to get tested um, unless you're at high risk. So I, we need to test more. That's going to help us slow the virus. Um, recent studies have shown the virus spreads from infected people 
even if they don't know they have symptoms. Um, so testing will will highlight how many people already have the virus, but that's also why we're closing schools. And I, I think the governor did the right thing in closing schools. I think we need to uh, we needed to cancel events. We've got to practice social distancing um, when in public. All of this is vital to slowing the spread of the virus. Uh, I think the decision to uh, in Palm Beach and Broward and Dade County uh, to close restaurants and beaches uh, was the, the right decision. It's really hard for the people who have been impacted, uh, especially uh, especially so many of our hourly workers who are really getting hammered. That gets back to what Congress is doing and why Congress needs to act uh, as fast as, as we can to get assistance out to them. But I think the decisions were right because they can help slow the spread of the virus. Uh, I want to talk about protective ear for a second. Um, I spoke to the to the Trump administration this week to advocate for for Florida's request for more medical supplies, more protective gear. Um, I want to use this as an opportunity to acknowledge and to thank, um, and I know everyone on this call joins me in thanking the doctors and nurses and physician assistants and home health aides and every medical provider who is on the front lines in this battle. We need to make sure that they have the protective gear they need, uh, especially uh, especially uh, the masks. And we are working hard to, to make sure that they do. Um, a word about closures, as I alluded to before, yesterday the governor issued several executive orders to close down non-essential venues where people congregate. Um, there are There is now community spread in South Florida. That means it's more important than ever to stay away from public places to avoid catching the virus. Now, grocery stores and pharmacies and gas stations and convenience stores may remain open, and uh, I I think what Commissioner Freed uh, referenced in in the earlier hours for for seniors, for for people who are compromised to to have access to groceries is important, and we need to respect that. Uh, In the meantime, theaters, gyms, and beaches have been closed, and as I said, I think that was the right decision. Next, on the economic stimulus, the <clears throat> impact of the response is severe. I talked about what Congress is working on to provide direct cash assistance. Uh, the amount is still under negotiation. I strongly support the plan. There are plans like the ones from Congressman Kennedy of Massachusetts to offer cash assistance, increase unemployment insurance payments, and, and fortify critical safety nets like Medicaid. Uh, his plan would give a middle-class family of four twelve thousand dollars $12,000 annually, Um, I am supportive of uh, ensuring that we don't have to go back and deal with this on a uh, two-week basis or weekly basis. I think Congress should act now to protect people for the foreseeable future as we we take strong action to stop the spread of the virus. Um, Sick leave, full-time employees are now guaranteed 80 hours of paid time off to quarantine, to seek preventive care, and to receive treatment. Uh, full-time employees will get 80 hours of paid time off, up to two-thirds of their regular pay to care for a family member of a child. And employers will pay these expenses up front, but will be reimbursed by the federal government within three months. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about all of the ways that businesses, small businesses, uh, will be helped so that they can also help their employees. Uh, Disaster loans is one of those. Uh, all of the business owners on our call, I encourage to visit floridadisasterloan.org. That's floridadisasterloan.org or disasterloan.sba, that's Small Business Administration, disasterloan.sba.gov for more information about loans available to them. Uh, on the issue of foreclosures and evictions, uh, those will be suspended on currently on all home loans insured by Federal Housing Authority, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac. We need to do more, and we're working to ensure that the legislation we pass pass, uh, will cover uh, all mortgages. Uh, On taxes, I want to make sure everyone saw the news, heard the news, that the deadline for filing your taxes and paying what you owe has been delayed to July 15th. No one should have to worry about uh, about uh, repercussions of not paying taxes or trying to finish their tax returns uh, while they're complying with 
um, with all of this guidance to help stay safe. Uh, so that was the right decision by the Treasury Department. Uh, for veterans, we're working to ensure that VA providers have the necessary equipment that, that they need, that veterans can waive co-payments for medical visits, and that housing benefits aren't affected for student veterans. Um, there's, there's much more on, for veterans that we're trying to include in the legislation we're working on. Uh, I want to talk about travel for a moment, again, all to ensure people are up to date. The State Department has issued a, a global level four travel advisory, meaning that U.S. citizens are advised to avoid all international travel. And uh, I've, been, um, I've been working uh, throughout to keep people up to date on, on these issues. Uh, I, as I said before, we've also been working closely with local officials in Broward and Palm Beach counties, mayors and county commissioners, uh, state leaders like Commissioner Freed and our Director of Emergency Management, Jared Moskowitz, uh, who happens to come from our district, um, uh, both of them from, uh, from, from South Florida. Uh, and I want to remind everyone, just as I walk through all of these, that if you'd like to uh, ask a question uh, or get more information about how to access any of this information, just hit star three um, as, as this call continues. So um, I want to say one last thing before I turn it over to Dr. Iovine, and then we'll come back for, for questions after uh, our two speakers. Uh, there have been, there's been a lot of, um, in this crisis, there have been stories about people who have tried to take advantage of this, this terrible moment we're in uh, and profit from it. And whether it's people dressed in white coats saying they're from the CDC, trying to uh, cheat people into paying them to have tests that they can't administer, or uh, hoarders, or price gougers, or people who, uh, who have come in to buy up the supply of surgical masks. Um, in all of those cases, we have been in contact with, the law, with law enforcement. Uh, I've spoken to the Attorney General's office. Um, no one should profit from what we've seen in the Justice Department and our State Attorney General, Ashley Moody, are both involved in looking to stop this kind of awful behavior. And finally, before turning it over to Dr. Iovine, there has, there has been, as, as we've gone through this, um, there have been so many examples of really good behavior. And I just I want to take a moment to thank uh, the businesses like Chambridge Distillery in our district that converted their production. Um, they're no longer producing vodka. They're now making hand sanitizer. Um, there are others, other businesses who have reached out to me and our colleagues uh, who want to turn over and are in the process of turning over their own businesses to make sanitizer, to make surgical masks, to, to make ventilators. Uh, and, and I would encourage anyone uh, who has ideas on how you can be helpful to also uh, reach out to us, press 3, provide that information to us. Uh, and we're grateful, finally, for all of the people who have stepped up to give blood, to give money, to recognize that as challenging as this is for all of us, some of us are, are uh, hurt even more than others. And, uh, and we're grateful to, to everyone who has done that. We're going to make more information available about resources that you can turn to for help and resources that you can turn to if you are in a position to provide assistance to others who need it. So thanks again, everyone, for joining. And um, next, I want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Nicole Iovine. Uh, she's the Chief Epidemiology Officer at um, University of Florida Health System, who will provide an update about the spread of coronavirus in Florida, efforts to slow the spread, and, and what we can expect in the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, Dr. Iovine, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Congressman, and thank you for the opportunity to help give information to um, all of your constituents. So the coronavirus, I just want to make a clarification about terminology. Uh, people will probably see a lot of websites, a lot of news things that refer to it as COVID. And COVID is just a shorthand way of saying coronavirus disease. So I'm going to use that term as I talk about uh, this, uh, this coronavirus. So, so COVID is um, uh, caused by coronaviruses as part of a large family of other viruses. This one is special because 
it is one that had never been seen before. So it probably came from animal, an animal, we don't know which animal it is, and when it made the jump into humans and then spread, it is causing this large outbreak because this particular coronavirus has never before been seen. So right now in the state of Florida, we have over 560 confirmed cases of COVID. Of those cases, um, we are able to identify that about 350 of the or so of those persons had a known risk factor, meaning that we know that they travel from somewhere where COVID is in an outbreak state, or they had close contact with somebody who was known to have COVID. That means that there is um, around 215 or so for whom we don't know how they contracted the virus. And that's why we know that there is community spread going on. It's one thing to know that somebody was on a cruise and contracted the coronavirus, but when people in the community develop it and we don't know how they got it, that means that the virus is spreading in the community um, from contacts of contacts of contacts in that way. So um, the way it spreads, uh, this virus, is like many other respiratory viruses, meaning that it spreads primarily when an infected person coughs or sneezes. Whenever that happens, droplets are produced. These are microscopic droplets that are produced, and they can travel in the air for about six feet. After about that distance, though, they fall to the ground. So that's why we tell people to practice social distancing and maintain six feet or more away from others because that's really as far as these respiratory droplets can travel. So that's the basis for that. But the other way that this virus can be transmitted is by contaminating surfaces. So, for example, if someone were to cough and they covered their cough with their hand and shook somebody else's hand, that can transmit the virus. Also, if someone were to cough while sitting at a table, for example, and those respiratory droplets got on the table, the next person who sits there, who touches the table, could then contaminate themselves if they touch their face or their eyes or their mouth with that hand. So that's the reason why we have our uh, guidance about how you can protect yourself from getting infected with the coronavirus. So we are encouraging people to practice frequent hand hygiene. And what hand hygiene means, either you wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, or you use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, which contains at least 60% alcohol in it. So that's very important. That's what hand hygiene means. Also, we are encouraging people to try to be aware of how often they're touching um, one's face, because we do that actually hundreds of times a day. And so if you are touching your, your eyes or your nose or your mouth, you could be contaminating your hand and then transmitting the infection to someone else. So we ask that you try to, as much as you can, be aware of, of touching your hand, of touching your, your eyes or your face. Also, when you do cough or sneeze, we ask that you cover your cough or sneeze in one of two ways. Either cough into the crook of your elbow or if you have a tissue available to cover your cough or sneeze, use that tissue and then immediately dispose of it and then perform hand hygiene. Either wash your hands or use the alcohol sanitizer. And then finally, also, I mentioned that surfaces can become contaminated. So it's a great idea to clean these surfaces as often as you can with your normal household um, cleaners. This coronavirus is killed um, pretty easily by 
usual household cleaners. So that's a really good idea if you make an effort to clean those sorts of surfaces. So in the coming weeks and months, um, I can tell you that we do expect to see more cases of COVID in, uh, in Florida and across the nation as well. I want to point out, though, that that does not mean that all of our containment efforts aren't working. Because what it really means is that if we did nothing, no containment measures, no social distancing, we would see an extraordinary number of cases. However, all of the containment measures we are doing at the personal level, social distancing, for example, at the local level, closing schools, for example, and at state and at federal levels, all of these efforts are slowing the spread of the virus. So I just want to be really clear that as we see the number of cases increase, that that does not mean that our efforts aren't working. What it really means is that we are slowing the spread of the virus compared to whether we had done nothing. We call this flattening the curve. You might have heard this statement used before, and that simply refers to if the number of cases is increasing rapidly over time, but then we do things to lower that number of cases, that curve of increasing cases, if you were looking at a graph, for example, that curve would become lower and flatter. So I want to um, also just transition now to about treating COVID. There is no specific antiviral treatment that we know to treat COVID. So I want to really emphasize that. When somebody is sick with COVID, most people can stay at home and get better on their own. For people that are, have a, who are more severe disease and are in the hospital, hospitals are providing what we call supportive care. And what that means is patients get extra oxygen, they get extra intravenous fluids, they get medications to manage their temperature, things like that, but there is no specific antiviral medication. There are a number of medications that are undergoing investigation to see if they may have activity against the coronavirus, but right now, we do not have a specific antiviral treatment. So with that, I will stop and um, I'm happy to answer questions as, um, as they come in. Great. Um, great, thank you very much, Dr. Iveen. And um, Jason, I'll turn it back to you in one second. Uh, I just wanted to, to chime in uh, again. Dr. Iveen, thank you for that that really helpful and factual and science-based um, presentation. It's exactly the kind of, uh, of, of thoughtful information that's necessary right now. Appreciate that. Uh, secondly, before we, we move on to the next speaker, I also wanted to just take a moment. I know I talked about healthcare workers before uh, and making sure that they have the, uh, all of the protection that they need. The same thing is true for our first responders. Uh, who, are, uh, who put their lives on the line for us every day um, in the work that they do, we have to make sure that they have the personal protective equipment that they need uh, to do their jobs in the midst of this coronavirus. We're grateful to what they do, and, and we're working hard to make sure that they have the equipment that they need. I spoke with the Broward Sheriff uh, a couple of days ago uh, to make sure that, that they do. And then finally, before we move on, I also wanted to just take a moment. I know I... I talked about the conversations that I've had and the, the, the cooperation between Commissioner Freed and Director Moskowitz and the Governor's Office and the White House. Uh, I also just want to specifically thank all of the, the mayors and county commissioners and city commissioners and, who are on the call uh, and, uh, and who are working to, in, in their own local communities to help address this crisis. Uh, their their information, your information uh, in providing it to us is critical. And for those of you who were out ahead of, of really trying to, 
to make sure that people know what this threat is and take action to stop the spread, I want to thank you. Um, it means a lot to our communities to have good elected officials like you doing this work. Um, Jason, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Congressman. We will now hear from Dr. William J. Quist, the president of the American College of Emergency Physicians. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Jason. Uh, it's uh, it's a privilege to be here, and I look for all these opportunities to try to do what I can to uh, both tell you about the work that we're doing in emergency medicine, but also help you uh, understand how, particularly on the front end of all of these, and I would include as as the congressman, congressman did all of the first responders in this discussion as well, because it certainly starts in our communities with them, and then as they come through. Uh, the hospitals as as they come to us. Uh, the American College of, of Emergency Physicians has about 38,000 members uh, in 53 chapters. That would include a, a DC, a government services chapter in Puerto Rico. So we do have a good sense of what's going on. I am an emergency physician uh, and I also live and work in South Florida. So I'm, I'm speaking not only from this national perspective but also the local perspective. Uh, just to get started, I think uh, you know some idea from from the uh, health system and emergency physicians' perspective on on what's at home, what you can treat at home, and when to seek treatment specifically. Because there's always those questions. You know, the emergency department is kind of the always open place uh, where you can come and get seen if you are ill or injured. Uh, but in these points in time, we certainly want to make sure that those of you who might have minor illness don't use the emergency department so that we can both focus on those who are more sick, but also your uh, your visit there with you and your family could potentially expose you to those who are sick in those departments. And uh, to start, I think if your symptoms are minor, as you've heard, uh, mild cough or fever or shortness of breath, uh, and you're generally healthy, you should first notify your physician and just get some guidance from there about what you should do Certainly, certainly, if you are sick, if you feel more sick than just mild shortness of breath, mild fever, those things, we are available for you to take care of you. Uh, that would also, I would say, include those who might have underlying health problems like lung disease, and certainly those who are more elderly or have more significant medical diseases. Uh, those should certainly be seen pretty quickly in a, in a hospital setting so that we can start treatment even though it is supported. Uh, in terms of testing, uh, the Congressman mentioned this fairly, I uh, talked about this fairly well. Uh, at this point, we are limited in our testing. In the ED, if people come there, we will only test those who are looking as though they are going to be admitted to the hospital and have more significant illness. Uh, we there are not at this point uh, testing those who have mild symptoms. So a trip there for that reason may just end up with you turned away. And in addition, uh, that test can take a significant amount of time. It's not something that comes back immediately. So you wouldn't get a result at that point in time uh, anyway. I am very happy to see that there are testing sites that are being developed. That certainly really helps a lot. I echo the Congressman's comment on testing. It does allow us to understand more what's in the community, but I saw also helps uh, at the end of this, all of our uh, public health officials decide what the actual course of disease is and how we can sort of monitor who has it, who has mild symptoms and does not. But at this point in time, there is still a limitation in testing. And so I would refer you to those alternative sites, of course, uh, to be screened and then determine if they're able to test you. One, I think, ray of hope on the horizon, there is an analyzer that is now uh, coming to our country that may be able soon to do more rapid testing. So certainly you will find out as we know uh, when that's true. Uh, the presence of protective equipment is a key, key point with all of us who provide this, this care. Uh, at this point in time across the country, and I would echo that also in South Florida, or in Florida, there is not a ample supply. In fact, there's a limited supply. We still are able in most of our places in South Florida to get the equipment we need, but it is 
it is at this time even sort of in a ration status since supplies are limited. Uh, we also do hope that as we look to uh, at the federal level that shortly we'll see other uh, companies that will change their production to produce these types of masks and we will have more of those masks uh, available to our healthcare workers because they're certainly pleading for that across the country. One distinction I think too is that those surgical masks are the first line are, as you've heard, our N95 line is when uh, we go from that six foot distance into more close contact and therefore are more at risk of spread of the virus. And so they're very necessary for us as healthcare workers to be able to have that less level of mask. Two things about that, I guess, to add. One is that certainly we are um, asking for that so that we can be protected. But the other piece is that those of us who are exposed without protection then go into quarantine. Uh, that does have a tremendous burden on the healthcare system for all of those people involved, whether it's those first responders, our nurses, anybody within the hospital setting and our physicians, uh, when we go on quarantine, it's 14 days then without a physician there to help take care of that, uh, that burden of disease. Right now, uh, we have the capacity to do that, but if this continues, it will certainly put a challenge on our capacity. So it's very important that those masks get to us, uh, both the surgical masks and the N95s and our other people who are providing for uh, healthcare. Uh, this part, a lot of this also is why it's so important to call your health provider first. Uh, we want to make sure that all of these resources that are somewhat limited uh, are used for that care of disease and for the care and protection of our healthcare workers and first responders. Uh, calling your healthcare provider can help give you guidance not only on your own care, but potentially where the resources are currently available for things that you might need. So. Please make sure you're contacting your healthcare providers first. And I will end with echoing some of the things you've heard already in terms of what we expect to see in the coming weeks and months. Uh, we are certainly seeing uh, an increase in reported cases. I would also, uh, of course, state that when we see those reported cases, that reflects those who are tested and those who come back with the result. Um, we've already heard discussion on community spread, and we all know that there is more disease in our communities than we are able to account for. And it is hard for you in, in almost every article and news article, the disease count is reported both nationally and internationally. And I know you follow all those statistics, but it really is not always a reflection of disease in communities. That is why, as others have echoed, it's tremendously important that we get as far ahead of this disease as we can so that we don't spread the disease. We, we also, I would also echo the fact that we don't necessarily look at this as a prevention of disease over the long time. It's this very contagious disease. It is being able to have the resources available to be able to take care of those who are most sick in our hospitals. Uh, as you've heard, uh, ventilators, all of those things, beds, uh, and to do that, we need to be able to space this out. And that's what flattening the curve does involve for all of us. I would just mention one more thing, because I think uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the real protection will come from a vaccine, but we also know that that's quite a long time away. And, and so we have some time for this to uh, be truly preventable by a vaccine. Therefore, we have to spread all of this out so that we can care for those people who are needing our hospitals and our healthcare systems while we work on that. So with that, I'll stop and I will turn it back to you, Jason, uh, for any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Jayquist. We will now begin our questions and answer portion. Again, please hit star three to ask a question or to sign up for the Congressman's newsletter. The first question comes from Mr. Robert Kellerman of Margate. Mr. Kellerman? Yes. Um, the lack of mass to get anything, is that going to be able to be gotten by personal people? Because I have a terrible lung condition. 
Uh, th thanks for the question, uh, Mr. Kellerman. I, um, there is a, the, the issue of masks is critical. I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna back up first and, um, and tell you that I, there have been, we've been in communication with the Department of Emergency Management in Tallahassee on the issue of, of masks. Uh, they have a uh, they have a big order uh, a big order that is in um, the goal is to ensure that uh, that the that everyone who needs a mask can get one. That means that uh, our healthcare providers uh, need to get them. Uh, it also means that high risk. People should also be able to get them, and I there are um, I know there are efforts underway to to make sure that we get them out. Uh, Dr. Jacobs, let me actually go back to you. I didn't have a chance. Let me thank you again. For, let me thank you for your uh, your thoughtful and measured presentation. Really helpful. Uh, but if I could ask you about guidance for high risk individuals and uh, and access to masks. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, I, I I think one of uh, one of the things I'd mention up front is the, the difficulties we have right now. Are we talking? Uh, and even if you look at the CDC as they talk about this, there is the 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 desired state we all uh, would like to live in, and there is the state where things start to be a little more scarce. Uh, and certainly, what I would say is that with people with lung disease and those more at risk, masks should be a part of what you have. On the other hand, at this point in time, as we sort of work to make more supply of those, uh, it is difficult to assure you that you would get one, uh, just like we struggle sometimes in all of our hospitals. My, my, so my recommendation first to you is doing what I know you're doing, which is that social distancing piece. It's, it's incredibly important for those of you who have those types of illnesses to avoid sickness and that's true at any time but certainly right so that first level is that social distancing that you've heard of and also that involves anybody who's a family member acquaintance will approach the house this is why we talk about this you can certainly have less symptoms but carry that disease so it's very important that the social distancing occur uh, i do believe i do believe that at every level uh, whether it's our private healthcare systems, whether it's our public systems, they have absolutely heard from all of us uh, that the issue of masks is highly critical for all of our communities, including our health care workers. I do believe that, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have the same access, of course, that the, Congress is, the congressman does, but I was on a White House call probably about a week ago, and this is one of the things all of the medical leadership uh, mentioned is we need more of this. So I would say, uh, Mr. Kelman, keep, keep in touch with all of us in terms of watching those things and the sources that might help you understand when is the best time to get access, because we do believe you should have one, but right now they're in a very difficult supply. And I- This is, Dr. This is Dr. Iovine. I just want to add a comment now to about masks is that um, having a mask, um, I want people to be cautious not to get a false sense of security if you do have a face mask. Because remember, the virus can still be transmitted if you have it on your hands and you touch your eyes or you touch your nose, for example. So actually wearing a face mask is not nearly as important right now as socially distancing and performing hand hygiene. Uh, and thank thank you both. And uh, Jason, before we go to the next question, let me just also thank Mr. Kellerman. Um, highlight what the doctors just said about about social distancing, which I'm I'm sure, Mr. Kellerman, you're doing, uh, making sure that uh, particularly someone who is compromised uh, is is going out of your way. This is true for everyone. Uh, to avoid contact with others, even people who uh, who don't have symptoms because they could be carriers. And finally, I assure you uh, that in my next conversation uh, 
uh, with the state about the delivery of masks, that there's some guidance put out by the state about uh, where the masks are going and what the plan is uh, to provide masks for people who are most at risk in the community as well. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Uh, thank you, and Jason, next question, please. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Mr. Steven Benivez of Boca Raton. Good morning, Ted. Thank you for the call. Hello? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. No. Jason, are you there? Have we Yes, Mr. Finney, are you still there? Okay, we will uh, move on to the next caller. We have Noemi McGregor of Delray Beach. Hey, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for doing this, Congressman, and everybody, thanks for being in the call. I have, um, I actually, myself, have been sick uh, no fever, no, no runny nose, just a little cough for a week. So I've been quarantined, but I have no information. I've been searching for information on what to, uh, how do you, how do I find out if uh, if I'm no longer contagious? Let's say that I do have it and I have mild symptoms. When is uh, a period that I can say, okay, I'm past that, I'm, I'm safe to continue doing the social distancing and all the guidance, but not have uh, the virus. That's one one of the things. And second, I have a lot of people calling me to say, if I don't have insurance, what do I what do I do? Where do I go if I do have the the virus? And third, I will be submitting uh, as a business owner a some suggestions that I believe will help some of the, our community. So I had already uh, received your your information to submit that. So again, thank you for doing this. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, I'll I'll take up the the issue of the small small business and and what you can do after we take up the, uh, the your medical questions. And since we have two esteemed health uh, medical doctors uh, on the on the call, two experts, let me defer to them on on how to handle this and and uh, if. If you have it, if you're sick, if you have symptoms, timing for all of that. Uh, Dr. Dr. Jayquist and Dr. Ivan. I'm, I'm sorry, I had to come off mute, but uh, just uh, oh, uh, my sorry. perspective. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Go, go ahead, ahead. Dr. Ivan. Uh, I I think in terms of the uh, you mentioned where where to go if you do not have insurance, and certainly if you're ill and if you're severely ill, obviously you. are will come to the emergency department and be seen there. I think the uh, the other piece that's coming uh, that will be very helpful is, uh, especially for those people who are symptomatic, is the alternative testing centers. So uh, as you heard at the front end of this, they're just kind of being stood up in, in Broward and the Palm Beaches, and that probably is the source for the, uh, the testing piece of this. Um, uh, in terms of the social distancing, I'll probably uh, defer that to Dr. Iovine, but certainly when you are symptom-free, there are still some days of time where you can um, you can pass on the virus. And, and so uh, it's not at the end of symptoms. It does require a little more time than that to, to be uh, symptom-free so that you can uh, go into other sort and not uh, consider passing it on. Yes, hi, this is Dr. Iovine. Certainly while you're coughing and sneezing, it's really important that uh, you practice uh, social distancing because you can easily be spreading the virus. Once you stop coughing and sneezing, though, it is a good idea to continue to socially distance for another three days or so because you will probably, you, you may still be having the virus inside of you and you could be transmitting it, for example, on your hand if you touch your face, for, for example, something like that. I would echo again, though, um, I would echo, though, again, that uh, uh, the alternative testing centers would be a good resource for you. Um, and thank you very much um, for, those, for, for those responses. Uh, let me also chime in. Uh, first, on on the cost of testing, uh, the, le the legislation that Congress passed, the President signed, um, 
uh, provides that no one will have to pay to be tested. Uh, and in terms of actually how to get tested, uh, yes, uh, you can. The CDC guidelines lay out the, the, the guidance for testing, but people can call, as uh, Dr. Jake was said, people can call uh, their physician if they have one. They can call the community, the, the public health uh, department in the county uh, if they uh, want some guidance, uh, or for these new facilities that are being set up, they can call the people who are running those, and we'll have more information on that. The ones in, in Broward, one by Memorial, one by Broward Health, one by Cleveland Clinic, but uh, we'll, we'll provide that information uh, as well. As, as far as the assistance to small businesses, um, at this point, uh, I, I would encourage all business owners to uh, to go to floridadisasterloan.org. That's where you can find information about state disaster loans. Um, those bridge loans are uh, up to fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars in certain circumstances. Uh, that again is Florida Disaster Loan. Um, floridadisasterloan.org. Uh, floridadisaster.biz, B-I-Z, uh, is for business damage assessment surveys. That, that's also worth checking out. And uh, I would strongly encourage small businesses to go to disasterloan.sba for Small Business Administration. Florida, just disasterloan.sba.gov for the Federal Disaster Loan Program. Those loans uh, of up to $2 million are available. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to, to check that. And then finally, um, I would also point out that the – I just remind you, as I said earlier, I know people are coming on and off the call. Uh, the legislation that we're working on now provides additional support for small businesses, will provide additional support for small businesses, but for right now, I strongly encourage people to, to check out those uh, sites, both at the state and at the federal level, and to reach out to our office uh, with additional questions as well. Uh, Jason, why don't we take the next question? Okay, the next caller is Richard Schwartz from Pompano Beach. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Uh, uh, can you hear me talking? Yes, Richard, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, the question I have is concerning this concept of coronavirus. Uh, in the past uh, couple, I get a couple of decades, we've seen three, uh, three of them. And what's to stop just another one appearing? Uh, why suddenly is this is this coronavirus appearing? And has it appeared in the past and just um, fizzled itself out? And um, that's the first question. I mean, why is this? Is it just that our analytical ability is, is better than it was before? Uh, that's the, the first part of the question. The second part of the question, which I really can't get my brain around, is if we all self-quarantine, we're all in our homes, and we stay there, let's say, for a month, and we come out, and will that make the coronavirus disappear, or will it be there, or will it all, all start up again? Um, I just can't picture how that's going to work. That's really um, where I'm at. I, I know. Is, is it possible to create a vaccine that looks at the coronavirus, some kind of um, something on the coronavirus that's common to all coronaviruses and, and could stop this for, uh, in the future? That's basically where I'm at. And, and oh. I'll, I'd like to hear the thoughts on that. Of course, thank uh, you. Is, thank you for the question, and thank you for reminding us that even as we're focused on uh, on the immediate needs, um, there is a bigger question about what happens after and, and going forward. And um, and I would, uh, I mean, we, we certainly, there's concern about reemergence, uh, but I'm going to defer to Dr. Iovine to address issues. Um, Dr. Iovine? Yes, these are fantastic questions, and I think you should join our epidemiology team because these are great great questions and these are things we're thinking about. Now, uh, I can tell you that um, we have uh, had, as you point out, a number of other outbreaks due to other coronaviruses. I think you were alluding to SARS, 
um, that was several, maybe 19, 20 years ago. And then um, more recently, there was MERS also. These are all coronaviruses. And so um, I don't think there's anything special about coronaviruses causing outbreaks, but you're correct. This has happened. Um, this is the third time we've had a coronavirus causing um, an outbreak. The reason, I, th I think the reason that, and many experts are saying the same thing about uh, why this is happening, is that the way our, uh, our society is structured is, um, is such that we are so much more connected now than we were uh, 30, 40 years ago. So if you remember when SARS happened, um, there was one person who, who contracted it in Hong Kong and then got on a plane and went to Canada, and it spread overnight from one country to the next. So that's part of the reason that um, these things are, are spreading so much more because we are truly a global community now. Um, I think um, you asked a really, a really insightful question also about what if everybody were socially distanced for a month? And in, in that sort of in that sort of scenario, yes, there would be no the coronavirus outbreak would be extinguished because it is transmitted from person to person at this point. So if there was some magical way that we could do that, yes, the outbreak would be uh, completely extinguished. Obviously, that's not possible. Um, so the social distancing is is still a really important tool, though, to um, flattening the curve as we've been talking about. If I could just add to that, if you don't mind, Congressman, the, the, um, there are many coronaviruses uh, that, are benign, that are fairly benign. Some of the colds you get are also coronaviruses. But I would also point, I think, to uh, the issue with influenza. Uh, you're, you're certainly more familiar with influenza and vaccination for influenza. And there are different variants that come out of influenza. And when we, when we circulate those influenza viruses, um, through the system, there are some years where we are exposed to a new one and there is more of an outbreak of disease. But even at influenza, which every year has a vaccine, which comes around every year, uh, we see a tremendous amount of disease in our communities of influenza of varying severity. Most of the time it is that some of us have immu uh, immunity and therefore there's less spread, or there are vaccinations, therefore there's less spread. But even that is hard to target, and that comes around every year because of all of the uh, genetic variations, if you will, in those particular strains of influenza, which also happen with coronavirus. I guess the other thing I would say is the, the other difficulty is, as you've seen, these tend to circulate around the world. So even if all of a sudden all of America stayed in their houses, and it, we, which would be fantastic from a disease point of view, but even if we did, it's likely going to be in Europe, going through South America, going through Africa and all of those pieces. So flattening the curve as we talk about it is sort of giving us time as well to work on those potential pieces that if and when this comes around again, will make it much less severe. One would be a vaccine. There would be also medications that might mitigate or slow down the disease process make it less severe as that circulates around the world and potentially comes back again in another year, we'll be way more prepared for it in that point in time. And one more piece of this, I guess, is what you said about, you know, what do we do? Uh, we certainly are also looking for that bright light when we are thinking about this in the past tense. But what happens, unfortunately, at times is that these things go through our communities, there is a big, big ramp up, but we forget all those things when we leave them in terms of how we might prevent that next one. And I think as, as physicians, as emergency physicians who are heavily involved with emergency preparedness, you know, those aspects in that debriefing, if you will, or as we turn to recovery and look at, uh, as our epidemiologists will also do dramatically, uh, we look at those things that we could do to prevent those things uh, from coming around again or to be a little bit more reactive to them uh, will certainly be very, very important. Uh, Dr. Jacobs, thank you very much uh, and to you and to, and to Dr. Iovine. 
um, and thank you for that <laughs> really important question. Um, we're past um, 11 o'clock, but I would love to uh, continue on. We have another couple of questions. We have. Um, I want to thank the thousands of people who have who have logged on to the the call, uh, and I I hope everyone has found the information, particularly from the experts, um, as as helpful as I have. Uh, Jason, why don't we go ahead to the, the next question? Our next caller is Mr. John Guzmano from Margate. Hi, Congressman. Uh, I had uh, two questions. One. Um, was about to see how funds um, in the stimulus, uh, if it could be expedited through direct deposit to most people, uh, if that was a viability to make sure they can get it to funds as soon as possible. And secondly, to see if there would be more testing in North Broward. I know they started with Pembroke Pines yesterday. Uh, sure, thanks. Thanks very much for the question uh, on on the the issue of the stimulus, uh, I've I've said on the call a couple times, and and I, I just want to uh, restate the importance of making sure that we have direct cash assistance, uh, and that we do it in uh, in the way that we'll get it out as fast as possible. Um, the answer to your specific question is yes. I believe it should be direct deposit. Um, Checks from the IRS is another option. The problem, obviously, is uh, not everyone can deposit checks from home. I, I think few people can. We're trying to encourage people to stay home. Direct deposit is the is the way to get it out the fastest and the most uh, most efficiently. So I agree with you. Um, we don't we don't have that yet. The bigger issue is that that whatever we do, whether it's direct deposit or checks, that it be done with the, at the highest amount that we can agree on and that we can do it as quickly as possible. Um, direct deposit in a bill a month from now isn't going to help. We need to do it, and, uh, and we need to do it within the next week. So uh, that's, that's that question. Um, on, the second, on your second question about testing, uh, there is testing, and again, we're putting these resources up, there's testing in Pompano, that is coming online, um, and we'll have more information on that. Um, Broward Health is is setting that up at uh, Festival Flea Market. Uh, they're going to be able to do up to 300 tests per day, and and there's a, a phone number that requires appointments. Also, uh, Broward Broward Health can be reached at 954-320-5730. Um, and again, as long as we're mentioning it. The drive-through in Weston is being administered by the Cleveland Clinic. You can reach out to them at 954-659-5951. And the one in Pembroke Pines is being run by Memorial Healthcare. And that one I don't think I have a phone number for, but uh, certainly you can get it or you can check online. There's also talk of doing a... Uh, a larger drive-through at uh, in the parking lot at Dolphin Stadium, and so we're uh, that's not happened yet. But obviously, there'll be a lot of publicity about that when it does. And um, I think that response to that question. Thanks very much for uh, for posing it, uh, Jason. Why don't we take the uh, the last question? Okay, our last question is from Judy Schneider from Deerfield Beach. Yes, hi. Um, I'm very happy to see that there is some funding coming, and I thank you so much for that. Uh, the FloridaDisasterLoan.org with the Emergency Bridge Loan Program. The only problem and the question that I have to you is that once you go into the eligibility requirements, the whole not-for-profit sector has been left off. Uh, religious organizations, which are closed, nonprofit arts organizations, which have stopped presenting, and educational organizations, which are closed, have been left out of this completely. So I'm asking you or to please advocate on our behalf and that just to let you know um, we're hurting too and we need some funding. 
and I thank you for hearing my question. <laughs> Judy, thank you very much. Um, I am, uh, I am, I actually uh, am a strong advocate for for nonprofits and, and cultural institutions and museums, and uh, and so I would draw your attention to two things. One, um, I'll, well, first I'll follow up on the the state loan side. Uh, it's a it's a good point. I'm glad you raised it. Nonprofits are covered by the SBA loans, uh, by the Economic um, Injury Disaster Loans. That program has been activated. Businesses and nonprofits can receive up to $2 million in financial assistance to help cover debts and payroll and, and other bills. So, um, again, I would, I would encourage you to take a look at, at that SBA website, um, which is disasterloan.sba. Dot gov. And finally, um, I will tell you, I had a conversation just yesterday uh, with, the, uh, with the drafters of the legislation, um, in this case, the, uh, the chairman of the, the Appropriations Committee, uh, to ensure that our cultural institutions, nonprofits and museums um, are included in the next package. Um, our, our, a lot of our nonprofits are being hit twice. Um, first, because the, they're dealing with the challenges that, that we're all de- other businesses are dealing with, and that they're shut down, and it's hard for uh, for people, to, it's hard for them to be able to pay their employees. Uh, but second, because they rely so heavily on contributions, um, they're they're going to get hit again when the impact this has had on our economy means that they're unable to generate the resources they need. Uh, I raised that specific point yesterday to try to provide some direct assistance to those institutions in the next bill that comes out. Um, I appreciate you bringing it up. It's, uh, it's really important. Um, and finally, uh, it's now uh, almost 20 after 11. Um, uh, one last thing. Um, religious organizations and nonprofits can also go at get help from from FEMA, so SBA, and uh, I would encourage taking a look um, at FEMA. Um, it's now about 20 after. I know we said we were going to go to 11, and, and people have um, uh, don't don't uh, may not want to be, be on this call all day, uh, but no, please know that uh, I'm available. My office is available. Uh, if you hit um, uh, star three, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter where we're sending out information, timely information about this. Uh, you can also reach out with specific questions that may not have been answered. Uh, this, as I've said time and time again, uh, this is an enormously challenging time for our community, but we're all in this together. And um, and please know that uh, that we're here to, to help make sure that your concerns and, and voices get raised at whatever level they need to. So you can call the office. You can leave a voicemail also with your question if we didn't get to it. Um, Finally, I want to uh, sincerely thank our guest speakers, um, Dr. Ivey, Dr. Jaquist, and and Commissioner Frieden, especially I know how busy um, you have been. Thanks thanks to all of you for joining us to provide timely, helpful, uh, fact-based information that uh, that I, I I know our listeners and participants have found helpful, um, and I'm going to turn it back, I think, to Jason to to wrap this up. But we, uh, one last thing. Sorry, we hope to do uh, we hope to do more of these. Our, our office number is 202-225-3001, and um, and I I want to do more of these. If you have suggestions on other guests. Uh, that you think would be helpful, other participants who can provide the kind of information we heard from our um, uh, our epidemiologist and our emergency room doctor today, please let us know that as well. Uh, I wish uh, everyone the best at this difficult time uh, to stay safe and to stay healthy uh, and, uh, and to know that um, this is a really challenging time. We're going to get through it. We're going to get through it together. Um, Jason, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining the call. If we did not get to your question, if you stay on the line, you'll be able to leave a voicemail with your question, and we will get back to you. Thank you very much.